Good morning. So, going ahead, I want to say that this is a talk about getting away with it. It being, in this case, shipping a large revision to a large piece of open source software without an embarrassing regression or a bug that required an immediate uh, patch be issued. My name is Emma Humphreys. Uh, I am bug master at Mozilla Corporation, which is a fancy way of saying that I am an engineering program manager. I'm a triage girl on Twitter. You're welcome to follow me. I talk about triage open source. I will also kvetch about other things. Outside of Firefox and working on the open web, I'm a huge fan of coffee. I'm a huge fan of tiny computers. I've been spending too many hours playing with a BBC microbit lately, and yesterday enjoyed the workshop where we were working with another microcontroller. Uh, Indie Pop and My Electric Bicycle. I'm also a huge hockey fan, and living in, in North America, if you're a hockey fan, of course, this is the most glorious time of year because it is the NHL playoffs. I am a Sharks fan, not a fan of the Oilers or New Jersey, but this is first right outside my hotel. So when I proposed the talk, I was going to call it Avoiding the Petard. Now, the term being hoisted by one's own petard comes from Shakespeare. Uh, as you might know, remember Hamlet. Hamlet ran a, ran a man on the middle attack on his uncle Claudius. His uncle Claudius had sent him uh, with Guildenstern and Rosencrantz to the king of England to carry a note. The note said, kill the bearer of this messenger, uh, message. Hamlet, being clever, opens the uh, envelope, because of course he was not using good crypto, uh, and changes the message saying, kill the person accompanying the messenger. And then Tom Stoppard, a few hundred years later, would come up with a play about poor Gil uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. The batard itself is a siege uh, weapon. It's an explosive that you can see is rather dangerously lit by the Fusilier, um, this also leads to that phrase up there, St. Barbara, who was the patron saint of people who work with explosives, and I think people who work with software do not let me explode. Because the Petard was as good as blowing, uh, blowing up the engineers working with it as it was uh, blowing, opens and, uh, blowing up openings and fortifications. Petard, unfortunately, is derived from the Latin for fart. And I decided, do I really want to do a presentation around a fart joke? And I remembered that my favorite genre of movie is The Caper. The Caper's cool. The Caper's like Ocean's Eleven and Heat and Heist. It's about a crew getting together to do a job. It's not like the Avengers where it's about how the crew forms. It's everybody knows their bit. Whoops. There. You built your team, you know. The guy who punches people. The hacker. The grifter or the social engineer. Here. The thief. You also get the driver in a lot of these movies. And it's a genre that crosses genres. There's a King Arthur movie that came out a couple of years ago that essentially is King Arthur as a caper movie. King Arthur grows up on the streets of Londinium and he forms a crew to go back and win the crown back. There's the great Muppet caper. There's even a caper movie that has Mr. Spock and Major Nelson in it. It was a made-for-TV movie in the 1970s. You even had this guy named Henry Fonda. I think he like did a movie a few years ago. 
So there's three things or conflicts in camera movies that you have to be uh, that that have that are the unsolved questions. The conflicts. One is, are they going to pull off the caper? Are they going to break into the vault? Will they steal the shipment? Will they break the codes? Will they get caught? Because you can be the best you know, team ever, and sometimes you get caught, and sometimes you pay the price. Or even worse yet, if you're Quentin Tarantino, the question you want to ask is, are y'all going to kill each other by the end of this? Spoiler, if you haven't seen that movie, yes, they did kill each other. So this gentleman here is Mark Mayo. He's our VP of Firefox at Mozilla. That's his Twitter icon. So I didn't think I needed to ask him permission to do that. He rides mountain bikes down mountains outside of Vancouver. And he wanted to form a caper about a year ago, or over a year ago. He said, you know what? Chrome got all our market share because we used to have all that market share and all that trust on the open web. And it's high time that we come back and we take back that market share. So his plan was this thing called Firefox Quantum. Now internally, we were thinking of it as Firefox 57, but of course we had to have a cool name. So we called it Firefox Quantum. Now to get there, we have to do several things. We're going to have to change thousands of files. We're going to have to modify thousands of lines of code, actually millions of lines of code, code in order to pull this off and not get caught and not kill each other. This is what you have to look out for. Now, if you're Billy Ocean from Ocean's Eleven, you have to look out for Andy Garcia. He's the head of casino security. I just want to call out Andy, Stark, uh, Andy Garcia here. I love this suit. Look at this suit. So his, his, he's wearing a waistcoat that looks like a curious. You know, look at that tie. I mean, this is a badass suit for a guy who's basically head of IT. In our case, it's a bug. You know, luckily, Bugzilla's mascot, Bugzilla's mascot does, you know, does side-eye well. Maybe not as well as Andy Garcia, and he's not wearing the cool suit, but that's the thing that's going to catch us. It is not the cops, not casino security, but a bug. So you need another member on your team, the lookout. And that's where I ended up in this project, is I ended up as the lookout, trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to find the bug that's going to kill us? How are we going to make sure that we catch it and fix it so that we don't have a regression or a horrible bug? And there's this other guy, I think he was on a TV show. Just give you an idea of the stakes is when we're working on Firefox, we were getting, during the period that we're uh, working on the final release cycle for Firefox Quantum or Firefox 57, we're doing 147 new bugs a day, 15,000 bugs total during this release cycle. So it's a lot of ground to cover, a lot of bucks to look at. How are you going to do this? Here's some numbers, and this is the only graph I'm going to throw at you, just to give you an idea over time. This top blue line is the number of bugs that were awaiting a triage decision over the release cycle. And you can see that we pushed that number down. It goes back up towards the end, but we were able to push this down. The orange line are the number of bugs that we do uploads on. You might know that Firefox works on uh, three, uh, three different release trends. We have our nightly, that's top trunk. We have our beta, and then we have our release. So if you have a bug, or excuse me, if you have a patch that lands in our nightly, in our, you know, in trunk, and you decide later 
that, hey, you know, we really should have this but not uh, skip the beta cycle and go out on the release cycle. We call those uplifts. Um, we had less than 500 uplifts for a major release, which is pretty good. Um, over here is P1s affecting or may affect. That's another measure that we're using. Uh, I'm not going to say that much more about it. But to get back to this problem is they need a lot of lookouts. I can't do it alone. So what we did is that we divided up inside the Firefox project responsibility for triage into a number of triage leads. These triage leads covered bugs in a particular component or a group of components. Their responsibility was to review bugs. They didn't have to look at these bugs on their own. They could delegate, they could hold meetings, but these were the people that were saying, okay, we expect you to be looking at new bugs in your component and raising your hand when you see the showstopper. The other things that we built on top of that is to use dashboards. At first, we used some native reporting in Bugzilla to do a dashboard. Um, the native reporting in Bugzilla has some issues, but it did create one thing. It was a place where every morning or every week, however periodic you did it, you could go and say, hey, what are the bugs I need to look at? And we were able to personalize that by, per, you know, by, by engineer. The second thing we had was, wow, that's a glitch. <laughs> Leadership. We have leadership from the top. So Mayo, uh, uh, from, uh, to the engineering directors, all knew that we had to find the bug that would stop us. So it wasn't me as a program manager saying, I need you to look at these bugs. It was engineering directors talking to engineers, saying, I need you to look for these bugs. bugs. So that's a critical piece. And then finally, consistency. When I first started at Mozilla two and a half years ago, what we found is that everybody was using, for the most part, Bugzilla to manage the bugs. But there was almost a tribal level knowledge in folk ways on how they use Bugzilla. So Bugzilla, for example, we have priority. Priority is P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, or unset. What a P1 bug meant to one team was not what a P1 bug meant to another team. We had to make that consistent so that we could see where we're at. And I would get push-ups, pushback going, people saying, Emma, why do I care what another team thinks a P1 is? And it's like, well, that might not matter to you, but it does matter to the rest of the organization. It matters to release management. If I tell release management there are 50 P1 bugs active, then release management wants to expect that P1 means the same thing, not, well, it's 50 P1s in DOM and 50 P1s that have a slightly different meaning in AV or in, excuse me, in, in, in audio and video. So getting people to be consistent about how they made triage decisions was the third critical piece to do that. Now, I want to call out the things that we learned doing this, because this was a, you know, this was an extreme case, this was a push. We were essentially betting the future of Firefox and the Mozilla project on this, and so we were willing to, you know, push a little harder, work a little longer. Process churn. We had some cases where bugs were being triaged multiple times. Engineers do not like that when you ask them to look at a bug, the same bug, multiple times. High energy is required for the process. Uh, we had people working weekends, and I don't like for people to work weekends. Um, people were on at all hours in our communications channels. I also want to point out having communications channels. We had a, 
a channel just for triage uh, that people could go to and ask questions. And I sat on that channel, I got up in the morning, made myself coffee, sat down and started answering questions, and pretty soon it was already 11 o'clock <laughs> at night or in the morning. But that is a, you know, but having, uh, having a gathering place, a place where people can ask questions about the process. But again, you just can't have people doing nothing but triaging bugs. A third is pushing technical debt. There's a lot of bugs that we just basically went, uh, I don't know, P3. So in our triage scale, P1 is the bug you're working on now, P2 is the bug that you're working on next, and P3 is a backlog. We pushed a lot of things into the backlog, so we essentially created this debt, we created decision debt, uh, as well as technical debt, by doing that. So the things that we're doing now to improve the process and get a little better at it. One is that we actually built some dashboards outside of Bugzilla. Bugzilla has a fantastic API for pulling data out of it. Then if you use a tool like Glitch, just curious, how many of y'all are using Glitch to prototype things? Ooh. Have some evangelism to do. Glitch is wonderful. Glitch is code pen for Node. It's built by uh, Fog Creek Software, uh, who are definitely believers in the open web. You go there, you can basically spin up a project. The default project is a Node server running Express framework. Um, this is a really great tool for building and prototyping dashboards. So I built and prototyped this dashboard in, uh, in Glitch, and then I just deployed it to Heroku. And we have this on our ambient dashboards at the Mozilla offices, all of our offices throughout the world. If you're a remote employee, you can also attach to these, uh, to, uh, to these dashboards and view this. And this is telling us where our hotspots are, because we really wanted to say, let's focus on our hotspots. Like this thing about untriaged, which is our biggest source of bugs. These are the bugs that come in from the community. There's a large number of these bugs, but they're all being worked on. Uh, we do contract with a company called SoftVision to help us with frontline uh, bug triage. The other thing we're doing is we're improving our documentation around our triage process. Uh, right now, true, uh, documentation exists all over the place. It's a problem in open source projects, especially open source projects have a wiki. Um, I know some people are feel differently about wikis, but I believe that wikis are places where knowledge goes to die. So I decided to pull out our triage documentation from the wiki and move it into a repository so that I can republish it so that there is a source of truth and that source of truth is under version control. And that's going under, uh, that's continuing. So the major thing we're doing next with this is looking at timing and scheduling, which has been the thing that we learned from our engineers is saying, this is a high priority bug for us. But I don't want to work on it this release cycle, but I want to say I'm going to work on it in a future release cycle. Uh, the piece that we're trying to determine is how much do you have to put, how much configuration do you have to put into your tracker to do this? Can you simply say the version for this is future or do you actually want to roadmap it? If we do have this ability to roadmap, we're going to have to change how we work. So that's a, that's a piece that we're going to have to look at. And then finally, documentation. I'm not going to show this video, but if you uh, search on this on YouTube, uh, this is the first of a series of videos that we're doing just to cover how to use Bugzilla. Because our tr no one wants to sit through a two-hour class on how to use Bugzilla. People are used to watching five-minute videos on YouTube where someone explains how quantum mechanics works, how dark matter works, or how to build a robot that'll chase your cat. 
So we figured that if we go through and take these key concepts from using Bugzilla and make them into these, what an old manager of mine at Apple called an info stack. If we turn these, uh, if we turn the training into a set of info snacks, uh, snacks that people can go through and access when they're saying, hey, I need to figure out how to put uh, a notify release management about a bug. I need to know how to triage a bug. I need to know how to signal that a bug is a regression. We're trying that, and the first of the videos is out. Just, just the simplest thing is how to read a bug in Bugzilla. How many of y'all use bug, Bugzilla as your tracker in your project? Okay, fair enough. Bugzilla's intimidating, especially our Bugzilla, because we have a lot of extensions sitting on top of it. Soon we're going to be looking at more aggressive bug resolution. Uh, one of the things we notice is that when you have 90,000 bugs that are a year or more, old, uh, that have not been changed in a year or more, haven't been touched in a year or more, that's psychic weight on top of your, uh, on top of your project. So uh, we're talking and we're going to go ahead and make resolutions on these bugs. We're not, you know, we're not saying that we won't fixing them. We're just saying, look, this, is, this hasn't been touched in a year. We just want to move it off, the, off of people's radar. Because if no one's touched this in a year, year, then it's not top of mind priority. And remember that bugs, once they're resolved, can always be reopened. Some references. So if you go to Mickey Mozilla Org Bug Triage, that is our current triage, uh, the current current set of information on how we're doing bug triage at, uh, on the Firefox project. Are we triaged yet? .com is that dashboard that you saw earlier. And then on GitHub, there, and I will make sure that I publish these URLs and publish this talk so you can go back and follow it if you don't want to try to take a picture and decipher uh, URLs. So finally, this is what I tell everybody, and it's terrible, and it's a meme, but stay calm, triage bugs. to take questions. Otherwise, if you want to join me out, uh, if you want to catch me afterwards, I have a small number of wallet fix pins, and I will have my sticker bag out during lunch time. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of people using Firefox, obviously, in a distribution like Ubuntu, Debian, whatever. Um, do you have any insight into that? Like, what, what happens to bugs from there? I mean, do you handle them differently? Just wondering what. So the way that we've been tracking bugs in distributions, we've been asking the distribution to handle them uh, in their own bug trackers. Uh, this is an area I think we need to do some more uh, that we need to do some investment and process on. Uh, the best thing you can do is to talk to our release engineering team and our release, man uh, our release management team. And I'd be happy to put you in touch with them if, if you have uh, questions with them. I know that packagers like to work independently, but I think having routes to, to do that because your bug in packaging may turn out to actually be a Firefox bug and we need to track it in, in Bugzilla. Right, yeah. And I think this um, speaks to projects like uh, a gnome and KD as well, they have the same similar problems of is this our is this our problem, is this your problem? Throwing it between the two, a bit defensive mode going on both ways. So yeah. yeah. Please, please do put me in touch. Yeah, uh, and yeah, I'm also if you need contact info, I've got my I've got my cards with me, I'd be happy to do that and help uh, and help direct people. This is an area too because we're building more of, of Firefox outside of Mozilla Central and outside of Bugzilla. Uh, if you look at the activity stream and big pieces of the developer tools are being built in GitHub. And this is a big challenge for us now. We have uh, a group, a working group that's trying to figure out better ways of, handle, uh, of how we handle that. One piece in that repo that I had mentioned up earlier, um, 
on GitHub for documentation is a process that we're trying to use to basically figure out, okay, if you have a regression that is caused by code that is in GitHub, how do you track that inside of Bugzilla? Because release management wants to look at Bugzilla as a single source of truth. They do not want to look at Bugzilla and 50 different GitHub repos. You know, they, they do not have the bandwidth to do that. Can I ask another sneaky question? Um, I do some work on Tails, the um, anonymous um, live distribution. Um, if you can imagine, they have difficulty um, with bugs in the sense that you don't necessarily want to give away that you're even using the product. Mm -hmm. So reporting a bug is problematic. How do you do, you do anything at all with, with anonymity in, in bugs and things like that in, in Firefox? That is a whole presentation on its own. So Bugzilla had, uh, Bugzilla has a, a community guidelines. We just recently re, uh, revised them. Uh, we just recently hired my sibling, uh, Kate Mancuso just joined us, and Z is uh, helping us with our implementation of how we're enforcing our community, uh, community guidelines. When you go into Bugzilla now, you'll notice in the, uh, besides the comment box that it says that your comments are governed by, uh, by community uh, participation guidelines, essentially our code of conduct, and Bugzilla etiquette. Um, we have some tools that were developed from a few years ago when we first had some major issues with trolling and abuse that allow you to tag comments and I can demonstrate that for you if you're interested during lunch. Uh, if you tag a comment has abuse or admin, that shows up on my radar. It shows up on the radar of a couple other people so we can quickly look at it and review it. Uh, we are working with, uh, with Kate, who again is our new CPG process coordinator. We're trying to build out some process around that. Um, the main thing is that the stuff that we built around four or five years ago when we were dealing with Astralis and removing a lot of the old infrastructure around themes because of the attack surface it exposed and the complexities that custom themes uh, caused us, that we were getting a lot of abusive comments. We didn't have people focused on community. So you do what you do as engineers is that you build tools and hope it works. So Essentially, if a new account was created and it got a number of bugs marked as spam or abuse in comments, then the account was shut down, but there was no follow-up. And there was no notion of gradation. So a person could say, well, you're being a little bit chitchy here, you need to step back, versus, you know, I'm going to kill you and your kitten are treated the same way, and you've got to treat those things as differently. Um, you do have to go through and get people to be accountable when they're being foolish, and you need to shut down people who are just being abusive right off the bat. So that's a long answer to your question about dealing with anonymity, uh, with, uh, with, prop, with conflict in Bugzilla. Um, it's an area that we're still working on, on, but we are building out infrastructure on it. Um, Again, if you look at uh, the work also, uh, Kate's boss, uh, Emma Irwin, um, Emma and I officially call each other other Emma. Um, Emma Irwin has got a lot of posts on Medium talking about how, uh, how we're dealing with community process and community management uh, throughout the Mozilla project. So thank you for your questions. I think we have a couple more questions. I think we still have some time. Yes. Thanks for a great presentation. So one of the problems with bugs is that it's sometimes hard to know what component broke. So maybe it's the DOM, maybe it's the JS engine, maybe it's the AV. So do you have any problems with mislabeling of what part? And how do you try to reduce that? And do you maybe have some stats on like how many times a usual bug gets mislabeled before it gets to the correct component? On average, it's about, uh, about one or two times. Between one or two times it takes for a bug that is not filed by a person I would call an insider to the project. And even on a bug filed by an insider to the project can, uh, can get it wrong. I can get it wrong because I don't live in the source code the way that 
that, uh, that engineers do. Um, we're looking at some techniques. We actually have an experiment going on uh, using machine learning to help us uh, categorize bugs. Uh, right now, the results are not very good. We're, uh, we're looking at what other metadata that we can use on the bug to try to, uh, to, try to uh, predict, six, uh, to successfully predict where it goes. Yes. Um, even if you do that, again, any sort of machine learning process requires humans in the loop. Uh, because otherwise, you're just going to make people very angry. It's like using machine learning to moderate Twitter. All you do is you never, you don't actually shut down the Nazi accounts. You shut down all the funny accounts that people love. Uh, so, um, but churn is a thing, especially if we go back to that slide. Let's see, can I go back? Right here, if you see this top category, Firefox and Triage, uh, with 126 uh, bugs that need a decision, decision, that is the place where we really have to be better about getting the bug to the right component from there. And when there's one more question. Uh, yeah. yeah, so you mentioned that you're doing some training for people to uh, to make it easier for people to get started with bug training. Uh, but, I mean, since you're also, uh, Mozilla is also making uh, Bugzilla, did you also make modifications to Bugzilla itself to make it work better for everyone as part of this process as well? Or is it something you're looking into? Okay, well, if you, could you re repeat the question? I'm sorry. I'm... Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Apart from the training, are, are you also making changes to uh, Bugzilla itself to make it work better for you or for <laughs> contributors? Yes, this has been an ongoing process. Uh, again, our engineering focuses on, on Firefox and the Firefox-related browsers. We don't have a lot of engineering resources that we're putting into Bugzilla. But we have been gradually, over time, making some changes to Bugzilla to make it easier to use, easier to read. Um, my colleague Kohei, uh, who is a contributor based out of Toronto, um, and I am blanking on the name of his Twitter, I believe it is Bugzilla UX, he has been the person who has been focused on improving the usability of Bugzilla. Uh, I would advise following his, read his tweets, um, he has a lot of ideas we're hoping to be able to implement. We do have the services of another engineer who is helping us with some UX work and some API work. But we do know that Bugzilla is intimidating and needs, but we're moving, I think, hopefully in the right direction. Uh, especially the work that we've done on the top menu bar over the past few months. Uh, the switching to the modal view has our default, uh, what we call bug modals are, has our default view. view. Uh, that at least does things like making the bug load faster because previously where you could do editing by default, we were loading too much. There's other things we need to do such as just limiting the amount of stuff that we have to download to load it, to edit a bug. We need to go back through and if you're interested in this, uh, Bugzilla, our, the, the Mozilla Bugzilla repo is up on GitHub. And we cheerfully accept pull requests. Uh, Autocompleters, uh, we have too many drop downs that are, you know, 200 items. They should not be drop downs, those should be autocompletes. If you're interested in helping us with that, that would really be great. And we have some frameworks that we want to use, and again, Kohei would be a person to coordinate that with if you want to help us with Bugzilla usability. If you're interested in triaging bugs, I can point you at queues of bugs like the Firefox and triage queue. And you know, even if you know, if you're interested in just like looking at one or two bugs a week, that would also be a great help. Uh, help. We are a community-driven project. We got a little bit more navel gazing, I think, over the past year or so, as we were working on getting uh, Firefox Quantum out. We are learning how to work in community again, but. Um, I do not want to drive you away <laughs> if you are interested in helping. Anything else?
So I believe everybody's quite hungry. Yes, let's so, go grab lunch. One, one last round of applause. Oh, sorry. Thanks for the question.